Uh, thanks for the opportunity to come. Uh, Patty, thank you for the invitation. In many ways, this is a group that I feel very at home with. Uh, although um, I don't have dogs right now due to the uh, uh, strains of an academic career, uh, I have been a dog breeder, trainer, hunter uh, over dogs. Um, and I also do biomedical research uh, with dogs as models for human genetic disease. Um, I think my introduction probably gave away the answer to this. Uh, question that's up on the slide. Uh, these are the dogs I work with, uh, or personally, or used to, uh, large Munsterlanders. Uh, and this is a grandson of one of the dogs from my kennel, uh, of whom I'm quite proud. So uh, an introduction and overview today I'll provide you. Um, I'm going to touch very briefly, recap uh, the issues that Larry touched upon in terms of domestication and breed development. And I'll talk to you about some sort of very basic principles of mutation, inheritance, and genetic disease. Uh, and we'll be talking about breeding and genetic disease. First and foremost, how as dog enthusiasts do we prevent genetic disease? And once we may have identified a genetic disease, how do we characterize it? And how do we work towards its elimination? I'm going to be offering you some very basic guidelines. I am not a population geneticist. My background is really as a medical geneticist. I work with the genetics of disease. But as a dog breeder and someone who works with genetic disease, I think I have some good rules of thumbs uh, that, that we can integrate into our approaches. Uh, one thing I really want to emphasize is the role of all of you within this room. Those of you who are clinicians, uh, you have an incredibly important role in characterizing genetic disease. Those of you who are breed enthusiasts, in identifying it and bringing those diseases to the veterinary community. And also there needs to be partnership with researchers who can get the answers uh, behind the genetic diseases that we require to improve the health of our animals. So domestication. As Larry had indicated, domestication of the dog was from the wolf. It would probably happened in, in one fell swoop for the most part in East Asia about 15,000 years ago. It was the first domestication event of any animal by humans. And in many respects, I think we as a species in some ways are defined by our use and domestication of dogs. Modern humans have really never been without dogs. Uh, archaeological evidence may extend the genetic uh, time point of 15,000 years back even further. And we probably saw a mixture of wolf genetics up until the time when humans developed settled animal agriculture. And that sort of makes sense. Once you had cattle and sheep that you needed to protect, you didn't want wolves hanging around the camp. And dogs sort of uh, were used to help separate that, uh, uh, those species from uh, incursions into human environments. And we probably got them set as a, breed, or as a, uh, a, a subspecies at that point. Our basic types of uh, domestic dogs, we can see in the archaeological record, and already 5,000 years ago, we had mastiff types. We had greyhound types. There were about a half a dozen of these physiological types. And that progressed in, in uh, human culture uh, uh, really unbroken, and we developed more skills uh, for our dogs to fill, uh, or gave them skills to fill more needs. Um, and we had, uh, as it were, some very ancient types of breeds. Greyhounds are a great example. We can see them on the walls of uh, Egyptian tombs. More recently, we had types, especially in Europe, which is really a hotbed of breed or type uh, formation, uh, dogs based on region, utility, size, coat color, coat texture. And the breed that I think is a poster child for this, in a way, is the Weimaraner. It's a large-bodied German hunting dog. It's from one region around Weimar. And it has a particular coat characteristic. It's a dilute brown and has a coat characteristic that's a short coat. That's sort of the archetype of a breed. Most of these breeds, as Marty alluded to, really got set when we had stud books. Um, there are some cases where breeds were known before then and really monitored carefully. My friend has a greyhound and she can trace her dog's pedigree back to dogs that were in the kennel of King George III because those dogs had very clear pedigrees. But most of our breeds really became structured when we had stud books uh, that came about. And that was primarily in the 19th century. And we developed from these regional and ancient types uh, the breeds we know today. 
And really dogs, uh, we've changed dogs fundamentally, and I think in some ways they have changed us as we have developed as well. So this is an article that came out in Science a couple of years ago uh, on uh, social cognition in dogs. And this article was fascinating. Of course, it, it published material that every dog owner knows, which is dogs get us. They read our faces. We can look in a corner and the dog looks in the corner. We can point over there and the dog looks over there. They have been selected to have a relationship with us that's quite unique. And this study came about because a fellow was, uh, a postdoc was working on primates and he was trying to demonstrate that same ability in primates. And he'd go to his boss and he said, I can't get him to do it, but my dog can do it. And the researcher said, your dog can't do this. Obviously, he was not a dog owner, right? Because <laughs> everybody out there knows a dog can do it. And after about the third time of coming to his PI, his principal investigator saying, my dog could do it, sort of out of spite, the PI said, OK, bring your dog in and show me. And of course, he did. It made science. But we have really, really changed these animals. They get us in ways that are really fundamental and important. And I think. It's tough to evaluate, but I think they've changed us. Humans, in the modern sense, have never existed without dogs. So, mutations and disease. That's really the foundation of uh, what I'm worried about or going to be talking to you about today. Mutation is a normal and a natural process. It happens all the time. It's happening in all of us. Uh, unfortunately, in some cases, those mutations lead to disease. Cancer, for instance. When mutations occur in the germline, in cells uh, that give rise to ova and sperm, they're passed down to the next generation. There is a natural process, and we can actually quantify that, at least in humans. They have sequenced entire families, the whole genome of every member of the family. With that information, we can now estimate, on average, how many mutations occur per gamete per generation. And it looks in humans that that's about 30. So all of us have 60 new mutations, so to speak, that our parents did not have. And if we extrapolate that to dogs whose genomes are slightly smaller, we can expect, if it's at the same rate, about 25 new mutations per gamete. So any individual dog will have roughly 50 new mutations its parents didn't. This is a completely normal process. It happens all the time. It can be accelerated by mutagens, radiation, etc. but there's also a background that's entirely normal. Most of these mutations, completely benign, right? If they cause problems, we recognize them as disease uh, mutations. Inbreeding does not cause mutations. When I'm teaching my undergraduates, when I'm teaching my undergraduates, this is the most important thing I try to get across to them. Inbreeding does not cause mutation. They are completely independent processes. Inbreeding increases the incidence of mutations within a population. Uh, and by the same mechanism that Larry referred to, founder effects uh, and, and popular sire and dam effects as well, which we are well acquainted with as, uh, uh, within our community. Um, Many people ask me, how many disease-causing mutations, on average, can we expect any individual to have? And that's very difficult to know in our dogs uh, 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 from my uh, experience. There's no way we can go in and really identify that. However, anecdotally and in the literature, my experience from founding dog colonies of animals that carried at least one genetic disease once we start inbreeding those colonies intensely, which we have to do to get uh, the, uh, the sample sizes that we need, it's not uncommon that you start seeing up to three other genetic diseases as well within that colony. So I go with a number that's about a half a dozen. That's just a ballpark guess. And there's very difficult to quantify. But when I'm thinking about deleterious alleles in an individual, that's, that's sort of a, a working number that I come up with. Inbreeding and genetic health. So when we think about genetic health, uh, there are really two areas we can think about it. There's the individual, 
If an animal has hip dysplasia, that animal is suffering from a genetic disease, or a, it's a complex disease. There's obviously environmental triggers, etc., but there's a genetic predisposition. I call that a complex genetic disease. So that's what genetic uh, diseases or genetic health is at the individual level. What we need to be concerned with is genetic health at the population level. And a rough measure for that is a term called heterozygosity, or differences between alleles. Uh, the more outbred a population is, we consider the greater the genetic health, and that the way we measure that is heterozygosity, the amount of difference between alleles that an individual has. Inbreeding is the foundation, of course, of all of our breeds, uh, and it's the foundation of domestication as well. Uh, we also have the use of popular sires and dams, so there may not have been necessarily a bottleneck that animals were exposed to, uh, but there are popular animals that we use. And, and that helps us concentrate the qualities we like within our population. It helps us make genetic progress in the development of our breed. And these are, are again, uh, the, the cornerstones of domestication and inbreed development. The primary deleterious effects of inbreeding Generally speaking, there are two. Inbreeding depression. The greater your inbreeding, the lower your fertility. And that may affect uh, every step of the process of reproduction, from uh, the reproduction of the animal itself to in utero viability to early neonatal death. And those are probably not diseases we really think about because they're losses before we really consider the animal uh, a, a puppy, so to speak. But that does have its effect. I work with skipper keys, uh, and average skipper key breed, uh, our, our litter size is pretty small. When I outbred um, some skipper key dogs to found the disease colony I work on, I had a litter first of 12 and 11 out of outbred animals. So in many of our breeds, there may already be inbreeding depression going on um, as well. The other area we can see the effects of inbreeding will be the concentration of harmful alleles that give rise to disease that we can recognize in an individual animal. So tools for our making progress. This is a really extraordinary time for us to be involved in the breeding of uh, dogs because of the genomic age. When I started my PhD work, which was the mid-90s, my whole dissertation was the cloning and characterization of one gene from cattle. And now all you have to do is type in a couple letters in a computer and you get the entire sequence you need. And I spent two years doing that. Um, it, it's going to revolutionize, when I talk to my uh, veterinary students, I think it's going to revolutionize that particular profession. And I think it's going to eventually revolutionize the way people view the dog and cat fancy. I think eventually there's going to be an absolute premium on health and behavior and well-being that results from the genetic knowledge that we're going to be able to extract from the genomic age. Um, I'm sort of at the front end of that curve because I'm involved in medical genetics, and first thing we're going to concentrate are the serious genetic diseases. But we're going to get a hold of the complex ones as well. And in this role, breeders, veterinarians, researchers are important. And I also want to bring up the idea of clubs. I think one of the most important things we can concentrate on is creating a successful culture within the clubs that are really the conduit to getting them the resources to help find these diseases. And I think in many ways that can be a limiting problem. Um, and uh, concentrating on how we build successful and good cultures within dog clubs is important. And again, the genetics, I'm very, I'm very uh, uh, a strong proponent of uh, uh, pedigree dogs. And I think, again, the genetics are going to put a premium on those animals. So this is the, the genome browser at the Santa Cruz uh, uh, website. That's Tasha, the first dog that was uh, sequenced. You can go to that site and pull up the entire genome and really get anything you need to uh, know about dog genetics. And we have tremendous tools involving SNP chips we're on one little glass slide. We can get literally hundreds of thousands of genotypes from one animal. Uh, and that's already changing the way we approach genetic diseases. So genetic diseases and inheritance. Very simply, I divide them into the simple autosomal and sex-linked uh, uh, inheritance involving recessive and dominant traits, 
and then complex. And complex is a catch-all. It comforts scientists because we don't have to say we have no clue. <laughs> we can say it's complex. But we are starting to get a handle on these complex relationships. So for our companion animals, the areas that we see diseases most frequently are recessive because you don't breed animals that have dominant diseases, right? Except in two situations. If it's a spontaneous mutation, it may show up, right? Uh, that's a mutation from the gamete down to the new offspring. And then late onset dominant diseases. We have to breed our bitches and dogs before a certain age, so we may find a problem with dominant conditions that are late onset. But those are going to be pretty small, I think, in number. The other big area, complex. That means there's an interplay of a lot of different genes, or there's an interplay with environment. And we know how we feed animals will influence hip dysplasia, prevalences, and then there will be combinations of polygenic traits as well as environmental impacts. Uh, I put up there pedigreed in different font color. It doesn't show very well. But there is, of course, this uh, perception that disease occurs at higher risk in pedigreed animals. I don't know of any study that has looked at the genetic health of um, uh, random sourced dogs and identified that as the case. And in fact, I can come up with a number of papers where recessive diseases have been documented in mixed breed animals. And the bottom line is we are getting very few animals that are true curs or mongrels. They are all mixed breeds. And because of the dynamics of breeding in those populations, you may have animals that have the same grandsire, even though they look mixed breed. And they're going to have mucopolysaccharidosis type 7, or they're going to have canine leukocyte adhesion deficiency, or they're going to have an eryth erythrocytic enzymopathy. And all of those cases have been documented, where disease alleles known in pedigreed animals show up in um, uh, what we call uh, crossbreds. So general approaches to genetic diseases. We can limit the incidence. That's one approach. The other approach is once we've seen them or identified them or have a suspicion, we can go after them, find the diseased allele, characterize the mutation, and then eliminate it through testing. And that process has been incredibly uh, uh, streamlined with the new technologies uh, we have. It does still, well, the technologies are there, but getting the animals to the research community, which involves the clubs, the breeders, and the primary care vets, is really important. So limiting uh, the disease. If we have two categories, limiting and treating populations, limiting disease-causing alleles. Our approach probably will depend on the age or source of that allele. There are some cases where there are ancient mutations. Um, uh, primary road con rod cone dysplasia uh, is an uh, ophthalmological disease. It's a type of progressive retinal atrophy. That is a really ancient mutation. It is found in the most diverse types of breeds. By limiting inbreeding, you're not really going to limit that because the frequency is so low within your breed or within populations. It's going to be a very low risk. Limiting inbreeding is not going to be able to attack that problem. More recent mutations, mutations that are characteristic of a breed or types of breeds, uh, they're going to be the things we can target uh, to decrease incidence by lowering inbreeding coefficients. Examples of that would be diseases like globoid cell leukodystrophy. This is a, a degenerative neurological disease. We see it in Westies and we see it in Cairns because it goes back to a time before those breeds were distinguished by their coat color. Uh, von Willebrand mutations in large German hunting dogs. We see the same mutation in wire hairs that we see in short hairs. Those are, those are sorts of diseases that we can help limit the incidence of by limiting um, our inbreeding. Another type will be private mutations, mutations that have occurred within a breed and may become concentrated because of popular sire and dam effects. Uh, and those are going to be the types of things that we can do. So limiting inbreeding will help us with these more recent and private mutations, but are probably not going to have a huge effect on ancient mutations because the level in the population is going to be so low. So inbreeding coefficients, I've mentioned that a little bit. What does that mean? 
Uh, it is a number from 0 to 1, or from 0 to 100, depending if you want to think of it as a percentage. What does it measure? It measures the percentage of identity of the two chromosomes within an individual that are the result of common descent from one ancestor. Okay? So if an animal had the same grandfather uh, on both sides, we can come up with a number that is an estimate of the identity of that individual based on common descent uh, from that animal between their two alleles. In animals, I work with uh, uh, mice. Most uh, uh, laboratory mice are fully inbred. They have gone through 20 generations of brother-sister matings. They effectively have an inbreeding coefficient of one. Fully outbred uh, uh, individuals, most of us are pretty fully outbred, uh, we have an uh, uh, a, uh, uh, inbreeding coefficient of roughly zero. So how does one calculate this? Uh, uh, if some of you have problems with math, I'll try and take this through, uh, uh, take, it, uh, 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 take you through it very carefully. It is the sum of what we call inbreeding coefficients for each common animal within a pedigree. By common, I mean is it in the dams, and the sire's side, okay? And it is one half, or 50%, and that comes from the chance that any animal is going to contribute one set of chromosome, one chromosome versus the other, or one allele from the other, from the uh, paternal or maternal set. So it's flipping a coin, and that flip gets compounded. So every time there is a generation, that 50% or 0.5 is multiplied by itself. So we're, here we have a very simple um, uh, pedigree with Joe showing up as the grandfather of Tim uh, in both sides. So what we do is we take 50% and we raise that to a power. N1 is the number of generations uh, from Tim to Joe on the paternal side, so that's Biff. And then N2 is the same thing for the maternal side. We have one generation, that's Tina. And then you add one for the generation that produced Tim. So it's one half to the third power, or 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5. And that yields an inbreeding coefficient of 0.125. So inbreeding coefficients for a sibling mating. So sibling matings have two common ancestors on both sides, right? They have Joe and they have Sally. So you will actually sum the inbreeding coefficients for both those animals. So it's 0.125 plus 0.125 or 0.25. And that will be the inbreeding coefficient for Cal in this case. Parent offspring. Again, you will do the same thing. It will be one half. There is no generation interval to get to trip on the paternal side, right? So he doesn't get anything. And gay is the daughter of trip on the uh, maternal side. We get a one for her, and then you get a one for the generation that produced Jim. So it's one half to the second power, or 0.25. and to uncle and niece nephew. So in this pedigree, Sally and Carrie are sisters, right? So we have to figure out uh, two breeding uh, uh, coefficients, one for Bob and one for Jill, and sum them uh, to get the total inbreeding coefficient for Joe. And that comes to, whoops, I have an extra decimal. It comes to one, or 0.125 in this case. Complex pedigrees. So what do you do if an animal within a pedigree that uh, is repeated is itself inbred? How do you incorporate that information to it? So this is the same pedigree that we had before, uh, which is um, a niece uh, to, um, or uh, 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 aunt, uncle, niece, nephew type breeding. What if one of the ancestors there, Bob, was himself inbred? So Bob, we count, I'm just throwing out the number, he has an inbreeding coefficient of uh, 0.0625. You figure it out the same way, and then you take 
one add point zero six two five and times that by his whole inbreeding coefficient for his contribution. And actually the difference that you see in Job's inbreeding coefficient for Bob having been inbred is not that great. Job's inbreeding coefficient in this case is 0.1289 and up there it's 0.125. Not a huge increase, less than half of a percent. So contributions deep in pedigree exerts very low contributions uh, to the inbreeding coefficient in resultant offspring relative to the primary breeding. So I get this from a lot of breeders wanting to know what inbreeding coefficient is too high or what should you target. And I really hate that question. Um, uh, I've lived abroad, I have a German style hunting dog, so I have a different perspective on what other people are used to in different cultures. In the United States, we seem to love to like rules. And you give us guidelines and we'll go with that. And there's no better rule than a number. Tell me, tell me what inbreeding coefficient I should stick with. But there are so many considerations for the health of your animals. Uh, you may have an inbreeding coefficient that's fantastic, but your stud dog is absolutely worthless as a breeder. I'm not sure you're going to want to use that. So you need to take into consideration the health of your animals, the uh, mental status of your animals, and I think that's going to be a huge area for us to improve our um, companion animals is their psychiatric status, really. Uh, how do they fit in the homes and what are we selecting for? Um, if you have working dogs, all those considerations. My working dogs, they got a point, they got a waterfowl, they've got a, a retrieve, they've got a track, they've got to be good in the house. Um, I'm not going to get hung up on a number uh, when I have all those things to um, look at. I do think going with numbers as high as 0.25, that's too much. That's a sibling breeding or a, a, a offspring parent breeding. I really don't think that's appropriate unless you are doing a test breeding. There are accidents that happen. Those animals should be uh, considered as test breedings and placed accordingly. Um, I prefer a number, if I'm going to have one, of 0.125. So that's a grandsire uh, to offspring mating or a niece uh, uh, to um, uncle or a nephew to aunt. Uh, you go one step further down, 0.0625, those are first cousins, great grandparents to uh, offspring. So I, I don't like to give a number, but if I'm going to, it's going to be 0.125. But that is also within the context of another approach, which is to alternate your breedings. So if you're going to inbreed or line breed one generation, outcross the next generation. I think that's a very important approach. Because in trying to limit the incidence of these genetic diseases, uh, um, the solution to pollution is to dilute, as it were. Um, so you want to keep your lines as outbred as you can at the same time that you're concentrating desired traits uh, and alleles within your breeding program. And again, as a rule of thumb, I like to keep my maximal inbreeding coefficient uh, to 0.125 in a given line breeding approach. And that might go up fractionally if some of, the off, uh, some of the ancestors are line bred, but as I showed you in that example, contributions deep in the pedigree are very, very small. Also, when you're line breeding, think about using different exponents, different offspring from lines that you really value, so you're not concentrating in your line breedings too much on the presence of one individual. So that really concludes sort of the population line breeding approach uh, that I was going to talk about. I also want, since I am a medical geneticist, to give you a sense of if you have a genetic disease in your lines, what do you do? How are you going to approach it? And I'm going to use as a case study a disease I worked on as a postdoc and still work on in a research setting, which is called MPS3B. It's mucopolysaccharidosis type 3B. You can see why we abbreviated it. It's a mouthful. If any of you have heard of Tay-Sachs disease, this is very similar to Tay-Sachs. It's a neurodegenerative disease of humans. Children usually succumb to this disease at about 15 years of age. We have no treatments. Um, and it was identified in Skipperkeys, which you all know. Do we have any Skipperkey breeders here? No hands are raised? I've never understood why people wanted to take vermin-killing 
uh, guard dogs from canal boats and turn them into pets. <laughs> But, but after I started working with the Skipper Keys and met some of the people in the Skipper Key community, I was really turned around in my um, rather snarky uh, uh, observations. They're delightful dogs, um, and they're real champs, uh, and um, I have a great affection for them. And they do much more than vermin kill and guard. So uh, I'll show you a movie of this disease as it presented to us when I was a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania. This is a five-year-old animal at end-stage disease. The owners took enormously fine nursing care of this patient. Walking, eliminating, eating was very difficult. This animal can see, but it's lost reflexes that allow it to blink. And even bending its head down to eat is very destabilizing to it. So that was the disease we were presented with. Um, one of the owners that I worked with had been to four or five veterinarians before she finally, of her own accord, went to a referral hospital at a university. And I'd like to say, this is not a veterinary problem. Uh, human clinicians have the same difficulty identifying these rare diseases. In fact, I would say we're better in the veterinary community identifying these diseases because they're sort of front and center to us. I work with a family in Cedar Rapids uh, whose boy has MPS3B. They waited six years roughly for a diagnosis. They were in the medical uh, 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 system before they got a proper diagnosis for these diseases. So that's not that unusual. In Skipper Keys, MPS3B starts at about two to four years of age. It has a clinical course of about two years. The animals are absolutely normal before onset. Some of them want agility trials as well as show uh, uh, um, uh, uh, titles. The only characteristic we can see before then was a slight coat color change. And the signs were all associated with problems of coordination and balance, and it was a progressive and severe course. And most of the vets that were seeing, uh, seeing these patients, all they could say is, this is bad, we don't know what it is, we can't treat it. And we really need to start, uh, um, when we see these sorts of anomalous diseases, get them to referral centers where people have the expertise to really dissect this. The outcome was fatal. Owners usually elect in euthanasia in a year to two years. We discovered it was what we call an inborn error of metabolism. These animals lack an enzyme to break down toxins in the cells, and those cells that are most effective are in the, affected are in the brain. And we can see those toxins in blood films and lymphocytes, in white blood cells from the cerebrospinal fluid, from spinal taps. And these little granules, those are from uh, cells that have been withdrawn from the bone marrow. And that toxic substance spills over to the urine, and we can do a very simple and cheap test, a screening test we call to identify this substance, which is a glycosaminoglycan. And we can then find out what specific type it is by characterizing it uh, chromatographically. So this is heparin sulfate, is this big band from both of our patients and we know because it compares well with the control samples. So once we had heparin sulfate, we had enzymes to go after, we could query the genetic database, get a gene, and um, here we have an example of these toxic granules in the brain. These are blue granules, they're not normal. That's the toxic substance that's stored. And it leads to death of that part of the cerebellum. Animal on your uh, right, is diseased and that cerebellum, that cauliflower shaped organ that lets us balance, very much smaller. And when we uh, uh, did the genetics of this, and this is what I did for my postdoc, we found the mutation. That was golden. We had a test to offer the breeding community. Um, and it was developed and offered through the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and it's basically an insertion. Each one of these little waveforms is a bit of DNA. And all of these A's are abnormal. That was an insertion where it shouldn't have been. This was the pedigree that we got uh, uh, from our initial animals. And this is how we published it. And you'll notice that the sex uh, uh, symbol used is indeterminate for these animals. And that was purposeful. One of the things when I approached the breeding community was they wanted to know whose fault is this? Which dog? Who was the source? And what I told them was it was so deep within the breed, there was no animal that was 
free of risk. And I did not want to put out there a publication that would allow very studious people to go back and identify individual animals because I just saw no benefit in that. So when you are working within your clubs, when you are veterinarians working with your breeding community, I think it's important that we remember to maintain this sense of confidentiality with our patients and clients uh, because I think it helps build greater trust within the community and gives us better culture to make progress with. So when we did test this for this allele, we had a huge response, over a thousand tests within the first couple of months. And though this was a self-selected population, skipper keys are not a huge breed. We tested over a thousand samples and we found a carrier risk or a frequency of about 22%. So the breed was on the crest of a real problem and we were able to nip it in the bud very effectively. So those are the things that you can think about when you have a genetic disease. You need to make sure you get to a referral clinician. You need to be sure that you are engaging uh, with researchers and hopefully that you have a, a health committee within your breed club that can uh, help with these conditions. I also want to plug the use of spontaneous diseases in our pedigreed animals as models for important genetic disease. I work with this uh, uh, disease as a model now to help develop treatments for children. We did some preclinical trial work for gene therapy with colleagues at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. And this work is now being put forward to the French FDA to use to help start a human clinical trial. So these are really important resources for us. And so you're doing a great good work when you help identify uh, diseases like this for humans as well as for animals. Uh, and this is an example of one of the patients, Lucas Montgomery. Uh, I go to a fun run every year. It, I get slower and slower, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> But I advanced to a new category. I'm in the 50 and older, so I was the first in that category this year. <laughs> I, I was the only entrant. <laughs> well, yeah, I got a medal for that particular category. Um, so animal models are really important for helping develop therapies for people like Lucas. Uh, and um, uh, again, we did this work at the Pasteur Institute. It was published in some very high profile journals. And I don't know that you can really see the slide, but there are some cell studies here that showed by the gene therapy approach, we were able to uh, eliminate the storage in the brain of these animals. Um, and for a particular example, the MPS Society, there are nearly uh, a dozen models of these diseases in dogs and cats that have been really instrumental. So DNA and test breedings, I did want to talk about this. When you have a mutation that you can test for in your breeds, make sure that you don't think all carriers need to be eliminated in one fell swoop in one generation. And many people think of carriers as being tainted. That's not right. They have one mutant allele. And because we can test and breed them to normal animals, they can be used safely to preserve the work that you've done with your kennels and my recommendation is make haste slowly. Choose a couple of generations, four or five generations, four or five years to get these diseased alleles out of your population. Test breeding. Test breeding has been a critical tool in the past to identify and characterize novel diseases. It helped us identify dominant versus recessive diseases and it can confirm carrier status. In most cases now, because of the technology we have, it's not going to be very important. If you have as few as six diseased individuals for a clear-cut, fully penetrant recessive disorder, you should be able to do SNP chip studies that will get you a locus, and from there you can get a mutation. We can make advances so much more quickly. But in some cases, initially, test breedings may be advisable. If it's a novel disease, you've never seen it, think about repeating the breeding that produced it. How many of you, have, if you had a serious disease within your litter, would never make that breeding again. A lot of you. I maintain that if there are diseased alleles that are producing that uh, a problem in your litter, other people share them. And if you can get a network of people to think about helping you manage test breedings, confirming the genetic nature of those disorders, confirming that disorder is really critical. So don't think necessarily about just uh, going on. If you have a serious problem, it's going to crop up later. 
and talking to breeders in the Skipperkey community, the same thing happened. They'd known about this disease at some level in some people, in some kennels, for a couple of decades. So when you think about test breedings, it's a tough decision. And things to consider, how early onset is the disease? How severe is it? It shouldn't be entered into lightly. How are you going to place animals? You can't sell these. You need a network of people uh, that will take animals in to identify whether they're going to be diseased or clear. And also club rules. Some club rules will not allow you to breed animals that are known disease carriers. And you need to be flexible with this. So successfully managing genetic health, partner with researchers and veterinarians, records. Keep thorough records on your litters. Try and know the natural lifespan of every animal you place. Try and know their major health problems. Um, and work to develop a good culture within your clubs and within the health organizations of your clubs. I like to put up the Portuguese water dogs as a poster child, so to speak, for genetic health and progressiveness. So a very um, uh, constrained gene pool, a big founder effect in this breed. And early on, before we had all these magnificent tools, they were identifying gangliosidosis. They were identifying juvenile cardiomyopathy, these fatal uh, degenerative diseases. And they were doing it through club action, working with researchers, test breedings. Um, so good organizations who are committed to science and genetic health can make great progress. And now the tools out there are extraordinary. And hopefully we'll get a, a hold of these simple severe genetic diseases and be able soon to start attack uh, things like degenerative joint disease um, and uh, autoimmune disease and allergies and behavioral problems. So I'll conclude and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them.